I just uh, want to start by saying that it's good to try to be less formal <laughs> and to just have a conversation if possible. I don't know precisely what a master class is, um, yep. but um, I'm very curious to share with you whatever opinions you might be having about cinema. I don't know uh, which of you have managed to watch my latest film or not. Who has watched my latest film? Okay, good. Um, I will try to say uh, as many different things that I already did this morning so that you won't get bored because you were there listening to me. But I would encourage you, if you have any kind of question, whenever just ask me so that we can talk about things which are relevant and important to you. I will start uh, by, uh, I don't know, telling you briefly how I got to make films because that is that's a story. Um, uh, when I grew up, it was this kind of communism in Romania, so we were just having one cinema school in Bucharest. I'm not originally from Bucharest, I'm from Yash. And that school was not really like open to anybody. It was uh, rather open to people working already in the film business, like sons and daughters of the people who were, I don't know, strong in that moment or working as actors, directors. So it wasn't even the point of trying to get into that university, and we knew. So uh, my parents were kind enough to tell me that I shouldn't be doing this. And what was important is to make sure that I just don't go to what we call the long army, which meant that uh, after you graduated uh, the school, you could get uh, in any kind of university and doing just nine months of military service, or you could fail the university and do the 16 very tough months. So the target in that moment, and I'm speaking about the 80s, was not about what you do in your life, but you know, just to survive. It was a very difficult period. And I started having this idea that I would like making films, honestly, by watching the Romanian cinema of the 80s, which was so strange because of the censorship that, you know, you had this feeling that it's a kind of, you know, the films were with people that apparently looked like us, but uh, nobody was ever talking like, this, like these people in the films. And nothing of the things that you can see in the films were not interesting for anybody. It was just propaganda. So I think that we all developed in the 80s this kind of idea that I can do way better than these people because it wasn't too difficult. And this idea, this sympathy, if you want, for a certain kind of realism in the idea that we, you know, we felt that cinema should be closer to life and with real situations and real people talking as people do. And then there was this uh, frenzy in the 80s of the smuggled VHS tapes when everybody discovered cinema all of a sudden and this wonderful discovery which was VHS. You have to, I don't know, uh, move back in time and picture yourself in a country as that country was in the 80s in which we had just one TV channel with just two hours of broadcast per day from 8 to 10, starting with the news bulletin about the Communist Party, ending with the same news bulletin, so nobody was really watching. And uh, sometimes in the 70s, they were still having some money to buy films, so I could watch some, let's say, European or American cinema, rather popular films. There was no cinema take in my hometown, so I never, I don't know, got to be shaped as this kind of... Uh, a French author watching films. I was watching whatever I could. So then in the 80s, there was this miracle. And I remem remember now that at some point we were allowed from school to just go and see the miracle, a television where images were moving without any transmission. And they were having this kind of VHS, which was like as big as this table. Actually, it was an umatic for those of you who have, have could have worked in television, a very big kind of cassette inside. And um, the first content that I watched uh, was a kind of a ballet about uh, DNA, kind of boring for uh, 14 years old as I was then, but 
the miracle of something that could travel like this stayed with me. So in the 80s, we started having this uh, uh, frenzy of getting uh, films. And then everybody started watching what we used to call nights of video films. And we were watching two, three, four, five films per night. And whatever, whatever kind of, of, of cassettes we could get. And uh, that was the time when I started, uh, um, I don't know, earning my first money from cinema because I was translating the films that I was uh, getting smuggled for different kinds of people. My parents were kind enough to buy VHS. So all of a sudden I was watching more films in, I don't know, a couple of years than I did in my all my previous life. Um, and then it was a very in interesting moment for the films that they were broadcasting on television because since they were not having money to buy any new films, they were um, rebroadcasting the older films for which they didn't have the rights, so they were cutting off the credits. And the film was like <coughs> starting in the middle of something at some point, and you were watching the film and said, I think I've seen this thing. But and all of them were called like Last Chance or Fatal attraction or whatever the, the titles were new but it was the same kind of cinema so little by little you know I, I started developing this very eclectic taste for cinema and this idea that I would like to do this but actually it's not going to be possible so I ended up by uh, uh, studying complete something completely different and I went to study literature which I thought in my mind it was the closest thing to filmmaking at the university in my hometown and I was preparing myself to become, a, I don't know, a teacher when the communism collapsed. And, you know, when communism collapsed, I was also working for a newspaper, which was um, kind of a free newspaper because it was a newspaper made by the students. And because it was uh, somehow free, it circulated a lot. And it was read a lot by very many people. Um, and that was my first step in preparing what later became my writing style. Because uh, that helped me a lot. I was always believing that I'm going to become a writer and filmmaking is just a small parenthesis in my biography because you know I'm comfort comfortable more in writing than in filmmaking. Uh, but of course, it became a longer parenthesis. And then I started developing this style which is very simple and very direct in which I describe what I see, and it helped me later on in the writing of screenplays. Once uh, communism collapsed, it was very fun to, to be in media for a while as a journalist. Um, I think we started by being, uh, I don't know, some sort of heroes in the first two, three, four weeks of the this revolution, because you were bringing the truth. So people were, you know, ecstatic and they were bringing up food so that we can work around the clock. Uh, but this uh, very poetic period lasted like, I don't know, four weeks, six weeks, and then we became the villains who did not agree with the new political party because, of course, they were some crooks. And but, you know, people didn't like to, to be told this, this, this bluntly what, what to believe. So um, that was also a very good um, period for me in which I got to do something else which helped me later on in my career. Uh, I moved from written press and I did some radio and television. And if you remember the, the 90s, there was this very popular American TV show called Midnight Caller. I don't know if you had it here. But um, to put it shortly, I started having this kind of night shows uh, on radio talking about, I don't know, this kind of very various topics which were very hot in that moment. But that was very helpful because it, it helped you um, build up your arguments all the time. Anybody could call you, they could say whatever you wanted and you needed to be capable of following this onwards. And that was very helpful as well in a way of developing arguments for a point that you wanted to make. And eventually after I graduated that university, everybody told me that I don't have any excuse now not to do what I thought I wanted to do. So I moved on to Bucharest and I um, got into the film school. I have to say that uh, I was not particularly, I don't know, um, very prepared to go to that school because 
the kind of uh, examination that you have for somebody to, s to see if he's capable of becoming a filmmaker was very, very abstract, and I always think it's very abstract. It's very difficult to talk to somebody and to understand if he's going to be a filmmaker no or not. They gave us a camera, and we were asked to use some actors and to shoot something. And, of course, we had no experience, no idea whatsoever, so we placed all the furniture inside, and then there was no space for the camera. Um, and we had to answer, um, you know, this kind of questions about meanings of films. And I remember that I had a, a scene from Keslovsky with a, a, a poor uh, a bee trying to get climb outside of, 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 I don't know, a jar with, with juice. You were supposed to speak about this. And, of course, you know, I could speak about this after University of Letters, could speak about whatever, but that was not meaning at all that I could become a filmmaker. And actually, I was told after the first year that, well, you know, maybe you won't become a filmmaker. So, okay, I will try, I will do my best. And uh, I did my best. Um, I had to pay my studies because the state wouldn't invest into my second studies. It was a state school. And that had a very strange impact because once I, I, could I needed to pay my studies, they allowed me to work. And um, after the first years of studies, I was trying to work television. I saw that uh, between television and cinema, there's no connection whatsoever. So uh, I asked if I could work for the films which were being shot. And from that moment, I got hired to work as a, an assistant. And I worked as an assistant for the foreign films which were being shot in Romania, for the French films and American films. And from that moment, I, you know, that, that became more like a second school in which I learned the, the practicalities of being on a set. It didn't help me too much into creating my film universe because that's very practical, but it helped me a lot in to get myself organized. And uh, I was doing my films in the film school, and I was getting this kind of experience. But everybody knew that the problems uh, s were normally starting as soon as you were graduating the film school. So my biography is a lot connected with a lot of things which happened in the right moment, to put it this way, but for which I was always trying to be prepared in the sense that when I graduated, I think it was 1998 or something like this, there was a new cinema law in Romania. And all of a sudden, there was a new system in which you could formally apply for funding to make a film. And there was this producer who came in the film school and asked, well, who are the you know, best students or whatever? And they said, well, you have these people here. And he asked, uh, is there anybody having a screenplay already written and not shot yet. And of course, I was, having, I was always having another screenplay ready. So he said, OK, good. So if you have it, I, we can you know, try and see if we get the money from the state and make a short film. And um, we applied, and I got the money. And they were only giving money for one short film per session. And I was very happy that I, 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 I haven't even graduated school, and I could already work as a filmmaker given the new law and because I got this money. And I was so happy that I started writing some other screenplays. And for two years, I was the only winner of that funding for making short films with three films in a row. So I could live from uh, making films immediately, and I could start and experiment some of the things that I couldn't do in school. And after these two years, I felt that uh, you know I can pass to a different level. Somehow, it everything felt very easily up to that point. I thought, well, I'm, you know, good enough. I wrote three screenplays, so I can move on. And uh, I wrote a screenplay, um, and I, I was thinking a lot about the screenplay because we were talking this morning about what makes a film. And I thought, okay, what kind of film do I want to make? And I was thinking more as a spectator than as a filmmaker in the sense that I wanted to do something personal, but that was entertaining. And I wanted to do something that would be popular. And I wanted to check after the film school if between my ideas about what's popular and the reaction of the audience, there's going to be a relationship. And of course, like uh, all the filmmakers at the be beginning of their career, I wanted to show that I'm very smart and talented. So I'm, I created a very complicated screenplay in, uh, that were uh, retelling a different story for the same 10 days every 30 minutes in the film. So I was having a story, and then 
a kind of Vashomon, if you want, and another point of view, and another point of view, and everything was so complicated that, you know, I needed to explain a little bit, but it was funny, and it was a big uh, success finally, but it was very hard to get there. I wrote the screenplay, I uh, submitted it with a different producer, and I got the money, and I was very happy. I said, well, everything is very simple, but for the first time, um, I didn't get all the budget. It was a different tool. Right now, I was passing, moving on to making features. Media didn't exist then, so um, all of a sudden, I was just having half the money that I needed, and I was having a very inexperienced producer who had just the quality of being the husband of a good friend of mine, and he had created this company in which he was uh, uh, selling, um, I don't know, uh, dirt for flowers, you know, this kind of soil for flowers. He didn't know anything about cinema, but he had ticked this box when he created the company that he could produce films as well. So uh, we started looking for money, which, you know, turned out of not finding anything because money couldn't be found like this. And that was a very strange and romantic period, if you want. I was meet talking to people. We didn't know what Khan is, you know. We know that this is a festival far away, and I was talking to people telling me, you know, I will be going to Cannes, and if you want, I can look around and see if I find money for your film. I said, yes, yes, please do. But I couldn't picture out precisely how this is going to happen technically. I mean, how is this happening in detail? And of course, they never found anything, but uh, waiting f to find this kind of money, because I couldn't start with what I was having, I uh, wrote another screenplay. Um, and we wrote that screenplay, I wrote that screenplay with a colleague of mine because there was um, this advertising for a screenplay competition with a very good selling line. The selling line was, um, w do you want Robert Redford to read your screenplay? I said, yes, of course I do. And it was something connected with the Sundance Institute and it was sold as an international screenplay competition. And we said, well, we need to participate, we do not have anything to lose. We wrote that screenplay, we participate, and we won, unbelievably. And what we won, we won a diploma, which was a, a $500 bill, expanded and in plastic, and that was our diploma. But the other side of the award was very interesting, it was a trip to LA. And I said, okay, that's, that's going to be destiny changing. So. They put us into a plane, and before I could proceed with my first film, I flew to LA with this uh, friend of mine from the film school. You know, nobody was waiting for us there because Romania was playing football in the European Championship with somebody else, and the driver was watching the, uh, the game. But you know, eventually we, we managed to get into the, the community there, and we learned that you know that that big competition was quite quite small when we got on you got on the other side. But they were trying to impress you, nonetheless, and it was interesting to be, be there for the first time. Everything was new for us, you know. We were walking on the Sunset Boulevard, and it was just the two of us, because everybody else was, was going by car, of course. You don't walk there, you know, the distance, al distance is also big. And there I met this, this Romanian guy who has left in the 70s, and uh, he was called a producer, and he was. I said, okay, he's a producer. Th this is where my money is going to come from. And little by little, I got to be, you know, quite acquainted with him. And I said, look, uh, I have this idea about the film. And he asked me, what kind of a film that is? And that was puzzling because I said, well, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's a comedy, but it's intricate. And it's also about, I said, no, no, no. Is it a romantic comedy or an action adventure? I had no idea. I don't think at all in this kind of terms. It's just a film which is very personal. And he asked me, how, so how much money do you have? I said, well, I think I was having something like 150,000 euros. I said, well, yeah, yeah, it's not really quite a lot, but I think that we could uh, use this money. I'm still having 250 for this series that I want to make. And if you we use yours, I think that we could make this series that I need to, to shoot here. I said, whoa, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm here to find like your money to help me backwards, <laughs> not, not the other <laughs> way around. And that was not uh, possible. They were taking us, and it was the first time when I met what is called a script doctor. And we were very naive, and we asked the script doctor, so uh, have you written any screenplays for any films that we have seen? 
And she said, no, of course not. The script data shouldn't lie because, you know, it changes your objectivity into telling people what to do. I said, okay, good, okay, we didn't know this, we wrote this down. And that was a screenplay, uh, that was a screenplay competition essentially for um, Eastern Europe. And nobody had the idea that somebody would really take this competition seriously and organize national competitions in Eastern European countries. It was rather made by a foundation next to RKO Pictures who was addressing to the communities living in LA. So there was the communities of, I don't know, ex-Yugoslavia and Russia and whatever, and we were the only guys coming from overseas over there. And uh, we were very disappointed that we didn't win the international edition of that competition, but at the same time it was funny that it was won by Mexico. I said, well, you know, Mexico and Eastern Europe are not precisely on the same competition. I couldn't put it right. We were a bit disappointed. So we went to the script doctor and asked her, okay, we haven't won, but you know, it's really important for us. We came here, we wanted to know what was good in the screenplay and what was not. There were like 11 countries and she said, well, I, I don't know about your screenplay. I was only paid to read the three winning screenplays. So that's what I read. Okay, good, that's very good as well. And I started meeting people there, uh, meeting filmmakers from Mr. New. Somebody, very nice guy from South America, somebody from Yugoslavia, somebody from the Czech Republic, some were younger, some were older, some were working, selling pizza to live, some others were on the payro payroll of Myra Max already, but none of them was working. Some of them were paid, they were living there for years and years, none of them was working. Hmm. I said, well, I don't know, I mean, that's not precisely the place for me, so I would rather go back and make my film, and when I get back to the States, I want people to know who I am, so I won't stay here, try to make a career there, I will get back home. While this girl I was with, uh, this friend from the film school, she drew a very different conclusion from the same experience, and she said, you know what? This is where the industry is. This is where things are happening. I'm just going to get back here, redo the film school, and then start a career here in the US. So we got back home, and I started trying to finance my film, and she worked and studied a lot, and you know, finally she went back and she did UCLA, or USC, I think she did USC, and she became a scholar. In uh, in the states and uh, but I produced her first films 20 years later. You know she couldn't ever do a film there. While I got back home with no money and uh, I had to decide what to do, and I decided that I will start shooting that film with the, you know half the budget that I was having, hoping that some sort of miracle would 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 happen in the middle of it. But of course miracles do not exist. So by the middle of the shooting we ran out of money. And I had to make a decision, and uh, I went back home and I took all the money that I was having from my parents, put aside, and I managed to finish the shooting with this money. We were very happy, and then I started looking on the internet, checking out if I could find any funding whatsoever to continue. And I discovered, uh, we were very lucky to be considered the third world then before media, so the, the, the funding for the third world was still valid for us. So I found this fund next to the Rotterdam Film Festival, which was for the Hubert Bowles Fund for countries in Africa, but also Romania, Bulgaria, I don't know, Albania and stuff like this. And uh, I said, okay, I will try with this thing, but it was very competitive. They were having hundreds and hundreds of projects. And I did something like, uh, I don't know, this kind of books with pictures. I took shots from my film and I wrote uh, somehow a synopsis of the film and I sent them this as an application and we were very lucky. We were among the five applications which were funded out of, I don't know, hundreds of projects. I was very, very happy, but there was a catch. The catch was that the film was supposed to be premiered in the Rotterdam Film Festival since they were helping you. And you know, I had started uh, making that film and telling my cinematographer that all I know is one thing, that it's good to start in Cannes. I knew that I wanted to start in Cannes. I was working with an older cinematographer who told me, <laughs> make sure you just make a film and you finish the film, forget about Cannes. That's you know, very complicated, just focus on the film. I didn't know much about Cannes, but I knew that I felt that it's good to start there. So I went back home and I managed with this money from the Hubert Balls to uh, finish the editing and some of the sound. I sent them the film, they said, yes, it's very interesting, we're going to 
try and screen it uh, here, but I didn't have the money to for the whole post-production to finish the film. So the festival came and I was having the film in the catalog, but the film was not finished. And I felt awful and very embarrassed. And then something very strange happened. It turned out that um, because I was doing all these short films for three years in a row, after my film school, they circulated a lot in Europe in a lot of festivals. I had no idea whatsoever where they went and I got some awards. And apparently in some of these festivals, a lady selecting films for Kenzen the Realizator has seen my films and without knowing she was like following me to see what my first film is going to be. So she was in Rotterdam and she saw my film in the catalog and she said, well, too bad. I really wanted to take this gentleman to the Cannes Film Festival, but uh, it's very good that he's here already. And they told her, no, 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 he's not here. He's just in the catalog. Actually, he, the film is not ready. So she called me and she said, if your film is ready, you can submit it to the Cannes. And I said, I, I would, but I don't have the money to finish it. And I asked her if it was legal to give me some sort of, I don't know, not a pre-selection certificate, but some sort of interest. And she wrote a letter, and I went with this letter to the CNC, and I said, look, we haven't got a film in Cannes for years, and I have this half invitation on condition that the film is going to be ready. Will you help me out? And they decided that, okay, we'll have an exception. They took the film from, from my producer, but they gave me the money to finish the film. And this is how I finished the film and how I got to be, the, to be in Cannes, in Kenzen. Later on, I was, you know, years later, I was talking to Thierry Femo, and he asked me why I haven't submitted the film to the big Cannes Festival, and it never occurred to my mind that as a, for a first film, I could submit it there. It was already too much for me to think that I could be in Cannes. And we were very, very, very naive and very much at the beginning of our careers. I don't know how you know people are today, but I feel that they are way more informed because of the you know, internet and everything. So we specifically asked for the Kenzen to schedule us, not at the beginning, but at the ending, because we were afraid that we wouldn't have the subtitles ready and everything. So when we got to Cannes, it was everything was very nice and very beautiful. The Romanian Film Center bought us, uh, um, you know, they paid for a room. We were eight people from the crew staying in the same room, some 50 kilometers away from Cannes and taking the <laughs> train every day. <laughs> but still, it was very beautiful and we were very happy to be there. Except that, uh, you know, pretty much everybody was left like buyers and press because it was the last Thursday or f Wednesday before the, the announcement. And But the film was very well received and eventually, um, we started having some press conferences and talking to people and then something funny happened that um, uh, we, we didn't have this idea of what a buyer is. We were so much at the beginning of our careers, we didn't make the difference between a distributor and a sales agent. And of course, in Romania, you couldn't have a sales agent. We, don't have, we didn't have the concept of a sales agent. We, you couldn't have a press attaché because you didn't know what a press attaché is. So, uh, and I was having a producer who was selling, uh, I don't know, uh, land, dirt for flowers. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the moment we had a, 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 a lineup, a press conference like this, in which we were supposed to speak about the film and how we manage. And he had a lot, he was, you know, very emotional and said, what am I going to do if the microphone is coming to me? And uh, I was speaking about the film and, you know, we had a moderator and at some point they, he was seeing the microphone coming to him with a question for the producer and he was like <coughs> 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 and he got out and he ran away for good and he never came back there because the problems that we were having is that people started asking us how much do we want for the film and for me it was easy because I was saying you know talk to my producer and he, he didn't know if to ask 1,000, 10,000 or 100,000. So he ended up by not asking anything and running from people away. So eventually, you know, a few months later, I went to Paris and organized some screenings and found a sales agent myself. I managed to sell the film a little bit. And at the end of that um, uh, Kenzen, uh, I don't know, week there, uh, we were told to stay because we were on a short list. There were very, very mini many films for the camera door because, you know, Kenzen is not competitive, but for the camera door, they were having 25 films and there were three people who were asked to stay. It was me, Carlos Regadas, and the French director. 
a lady. And we stayed unt until the last moment, and it was that French lady who got the camera door, but I don't think she made the film ever since. I met Carlos every other time when I got back to Cannes, and I got to be quite good friends with him. Um, and I don't know how my life would have changed if I got the, 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 the camera door, but it changed because I didn't get it. So I was having another kind of objective, and first of all, my objective was if I ever get back here to Cannes with another film, I'm going to have a sales agent, a uh, press attaché, uh, and I will know how to do things. This will never happen again. So, you know, eventually uh, then I entered in the beautiful world of advertising because I, you know, I needed to, to live. But some five years later, I did this other film, which was my second film for months, three weeks, and two days. And um, that was also a film, you know, talking about budgets and co-productions and stuff. I didn't have any support whatsoever from no other country. And I have to say that, you know, that was in a way good because I could go very, very fast. I always go very, very fast. I was writing the screenplay in, I think, September. And in December, I was, vi I was shooting because uh, I submitted the screenplay immediately after I finished writing. I got the money from the CNC. I shot in December and a little bit in January. And while shooting, I felt that that's going to be a good film. And because, you know, I did something for that film. I, I spoke about this a little bit in the morning. For that film, I started challenging all the decisions that you normally make as a filmmaker. And I decided not to decide anything before knowing why am I deciding like this? Why do I place the camera like this? Uh, what kind of you know, material is suitable for cinema and so on? And uh, by the end of January, I had edited the first version of the screenplay. I called to my good friends in Rotterdam. Romania was not uh, the third world any longer. They couldn't help me, unfortunately, with this funding, but they organized this kind of um, closed screening only for sales agents and distributors. And they screened the film there. It was a rough cut on VHS. But you know, that was good, good enough already. And some rumors started spreading among the worlds of European professionals. And eventually, two weeks later in Berlin, uh, everybody wanted to find out where is this film going to end up as a, as a sales agent. Meanwhile, um, the film was uh, got this uh, informal confirmation that it's going to be to Cannes. I was very happy, but it was informal. And so um, I did something, you know, like um, people who are not experienced. Um, we designed in the office 10 DVDs with the film. I bought a market uh, pass for, for a girl in the office, and I said, okay, we are going to go to the market and pass from booth to booth and give them this film on DVD and saying, you know, we don't have distributor, we hope we'll be in Cannes, will you try to represent our, our film? And of course, nobody did, then nobody even watched, uh, you know, like, okay, let it there, you know, it's okay. But eventually, um, when news came out that the film is going to be in Cannes, that was the, the first moment in my life where I could First of all, negotiate to people. I got calls from everybody, all the sales agents in Europe. All of a sudden, people wanted to represent the film. And among everybody, all, all the people that I was speaking with, there was uh, this guy who knew what to tell me. At the beginning, it was Wild Bunch. And at the beginning, he told me, unfortunately, we have eight films which are going to be in competition, so, and we have a special relationship with Romania, this kind of blah, blah. So um, the moment we are going to represent the film there, we need to have more time, so we won't. We will pass. I said, okay, no problem. I have a lot of choices. Some 10 days later, he came and said, well, actually, we don't have eight films. Uh, you know, just one was picked, so we have some time. Uh, I said, okay, but I talked to some other people, and s they said, well, yes, but you know what? Your film, apparently, for now, is just in answer ton regard. So and I think that your film deserves to be in competition. Oh, I said, yes, I think it deserves to be. In <laughs> you know, he honestly said what I wanted to hear. And uh, eventually, the day before uh, the public announcement, um, Fremo and the committee decided to promote some films from Ansartan Regal to the competition, and this is how I got to be in competition. Eventually, five years later, I invited uh, Vincent Maraval, who was representing Wild Bunch then, for a speech in Bucharest, and he confessed that the moment when he told me that the film deserves to be in competition, he knew already that the film is going to be in competition because he didn't have any power whatsoever to change this, but he had the information as the insider. He said, okay, this is it, this is it, and he did his best. And um, 
then I got we got to 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 present the film there, and that was a big 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 step forward, because as you were mentioning about the Romanian new wave, I had my film in Kansen, Christy Puy had his film in Kansen, and then Corneliu got Corneliu Porumbu got the camera door for his first film in Ansaltan Regal. So, and there were there was another Romanian director who died very young who did this as well and Christy Puyo so already that level was was uh, reached so the next level which wasn't reached was to get back to competition after I don't know some 20 years so the moment when I got back to competition I was sure that my aim is reached I was very happy I was talking to Wild Bunch and they said okay you have a rookie here in competition we were given two slots you can be the first film in competition or the last film what do you want? I said, I have no idea. You pick this up. And they said, okay, we're going to be the first. We're going to smash them for 24 hours. Everybody will speak about the film. After the weekend, they will forget. They will pass to something else, but we will have our moment of glory. And we started with the film. The film was very well received. And instead of spending three days in Cannes, they told me that I need to stay up to one more day and one more day. and. By the end of the festival, you know, there was this uh, rumor starting to spread. People liked the film. It was a very, very nice feeling for you as a filmmaker that people were speaking about the film on the streets because they didn't know you. And you were going to parties and they were like, hello, I'm a filmmaker from Palestine and I'm from, from Chile. And I said, yeah, I'm from Romania. Which is your film? It's four months. Four months? Wow, you don't look at all like the director of that film. <laughs> said, okay, whatever that means, you know, you know, I mean. I don't know what this means, but, and you know, little by little by little, we started by the end of the festival feeling what pressure is, because it's the pressure of expectation, and everybody considered that, you know, we might get something, and uh, the pressure was, you know, enhanced by this idea that the Romanian television had uh, to send uh, and to broadcast for the first time directly the award ceremony and to have a special crew follow us there. <laughs> we felt like, oh my God, this is too much. Um, and eventually, you know, um, I have to say that this kind of pressure pretty much ruined the, the joy of uh, getting the award because we were all very prepared to know what to say in case we get it and not to say, hello, mom, thank you so much. I always wanted to do this. I was always considering that if you're giving the microphone, you need to pass some message and, you know, use it well, not just cry and stuff like this. And um, I was very happy that, uh, you know, a, a long time dream of mine since I was very young happened because it was Jane Fonda who gave me the the, the award. And I discovered how, how long ago all this was because this year it was again Jane Fonda. So I realized that my, my palm door is already so much history that they could bring her back and give another <laughs> award. You know. Yeah, that was a um, long story short about my biography. And let's proceed to whatever kind of questions you might be having. Um, of course, uh, you are the star. I like it very much how you explain the dream from where you're a student, the situation of communism, the situation of television, how to be filmmaker, your trip in LA, and then finally reaching all the steps till can, which is really, really nice to know which is behind. You know, in the, in the so uh, the floor is yours to make questions. I have a couple already, if you are shy, uh, but please uh, raise your hand and a microphone uh, will uh, right there. It started, I, I mean, this doesn't belong to us as a term. I think some journalists called it like this and it became yeah, known as this. But that was not uh, a conscious effort of coagulating a movement. Um, we do not come, all of us, from the same film school, most of us, but not all of us. We never spoke about having um, common film manifesto whatever i think we were influenced a little bit about the um, danish dogma which was created while we were in the film school and i think we were all influenced but by what i was telling you this reaction to the romanian cinema of the 80s which was very 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 intricate people were focusing directors were focusing to passing 
a sort of you know messages against the regime but they were not preoccupied of having you know a very straightforward cinema and we felt that that's not the direction to follow once we had the freedom to express ourselves as filmmakers. Uh, the first 10 years after the fall of communism, up to the year 2000, um, only brought the creation of the same directors who didn't really know what to do in the new situation without censorship because that kind of uh, um, very metaphorical cinema that they were used to was not useful any longer. So they moved to a very commentative kind of cinema in which everybody was shouting a lot. There were a lot of screams and people were talking about the problems of the day and there were very chaotic times and that cinema looked as chaotic as the situation. And then we had the moment zero in the Romanian cinema. It was more or less the year 2000 in which we couldn't produce any film whatsoever. We were in between two cinema laws, so we couldn't produce with the old law, the new law was not present. And in between, in these 10 years, we have lost the cinema theaters. We had some 600 when communism collapsed in 1989. There were some, there were some 60 to 80 left in the years 2000. And together with them, we lost the audience. We lost completely the audience because, you know, um, Capitalism came in that country immediately and in the most savage way, if you want it. It wasn't capitalism, it was the Wild East. Everything was possible, everything was privatized, and all of a sudden with a couple of, I don't know, dollars or whatever we had then, Deutsche Marks, you could have 30 channels on TV. Just imagine passing from one TV channel of two hours to 30 channels on TV. Nobody was going to cinema any longer. The cinemas were in a very, very poor shape. Uh, you know, in the 80s, they didn't have the money to refurbish the heat heating system, and this is what killed them. We had a few consecutive winters, which were very cold, and if you don't heat the system, it collapsed completely. So if you wanted to go to cinema in Romania in these 10 years, uh, the projectionist would give you a blanket and you were supposed to stay with that blanket and watch the film, and that's not the way of watching a film. So when we started graduating from the film school by the end of the, the 90s, and we thought about making films, we knew that we were not going to make films for a big audience because it was impossible to reach a big audience. And therefore, you know, I think that we came more or less with this idea from the film school and from the situation that our films are going to be destined directly for the history of cinema. It sounds a bit ridiculous, I know, but that was the ambition, that you need to make sure that you understand what the language of cinema is, is and to find, to explore new ways of using it, and to express yourself very bluntly without thinking for a second about the audience in the sense that you have to be uh, very honest only with your means as a filmmaker. If the audience will follow you, very good. If not, we you are not supposed to make any compromise for the public taste. And this is how you know, we got to um, experiment our ideas. And all of a sudden, this created a certain style and a certain brutality of expressing very strong ideas in a very blunt, direct way, and that was perceived as new. And the style was quite new. The style was not mm, that formal as the style of the dogma. We didn't have the formal things with the light and whatever, but it was pretty blunt in the sense that, you know, you, was, you wouldn't use what we consider to be these tricks. So forget about music and forget about editing. Can you work with your bare hands and make a story that would keep you glued <coughs> on the chair without any kind of help? And eventually this is what I managed to do with my second film. You know, after you want to become, to be very complicated and smart at the beginning, you learn that what's difficult is to be simple. That's way more difficult in cinema. Can you be very simple, have just one line of narrative and keep the people there glued to the screen? And this is how we got to 
create some films in a very challenging environment. And because what happened is that um, we started getting back an attention from the Cannes Film Festival, which had a crucial role in the creating of this, you know, Romanian new wave. Uh, because you can do whatever unless there's somebody abroad to validate you. You know, we come from a, a small culture, and small cultures are always validated by a foreign instance, not by the local instance. So for us, it was the Cannes Film Festival who picked up these directors, and all of a sudden they were following what was happening, and it was not just about one director. There were two, then three, four, five, and we created this idea that there's a generation of people, because we were more or less people between 35 and 40 when we started, and that created this idea that there's a general manifesto, because we were having the sympathy for realism, and for, I don't know, some five, ten years, this became quite popular in a way. And I think it's, 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 it's still popular for a lot of filmmakers in a lot of countries where I go, because if we still get something 15, 20 years later, it's this bluntness. The idea of making films not about what everybody else is making a film, but about things that people don't want to listen and hear into a film. And actually this is why I asked you if you've seen my latest film. Uh, because, uh, you know, the film was uh, sold in many countries and popular and I got, I was, um, I got all the regular applauses when you start screening a film in Cannes, in Grand Théâtre, Lumière, very nice, but there was a moment in the screening when the film becomes very politically incorrect and it quotes some things which, you know, you don't even dare to speak aloud about them in your kitchen. <laughs> when there was this silence in the audience all of a sudden, and people didn't really know how to to respond to this, because uh, normally cinema stopped challenging them. And that's a bit of a problem. And we started having this conversation a bit earlier about what people consider to be material for cinema nowadays. And I think we're having a big problem that now there are some topics of the day. I have to read a lot of screenplays because I work for this development kind of lab that I created. I think that I don't know, eight out of ten have the same topics. Sorry to say, but people press some buttons. They believe they know what festivals like, what, uh, what are the progressive values of the day that you need to speak about. That's not creative. I'm not interested in this. I've seen this already. Question is, do you have something personal and completely different, even if very incorrect, that is personal enough and you could tell me? I'm more interested in that. I don't think that cinema needs to be politically correct. Not at all. It doesn't have any duty whatsoever. It doesn't need to be educational. It doesn't need to be didactical. It just needs to be truthful to its purpose as cinema. And that's all. And, you know, this is a bit difficult today because uh, as we were used to handle that kind of censorship that we had in the communist times, I think, I feel that nowadays there's a kind of an internal reverse censorship about what you can tell and what you shouldn't be telling, uh, w which is not healthy. And as a filmmaker now, what you should do, you should always cha challenge your freedom as a filmmaker to check if you can still talk about things which, you know, are, are now banned by this uh, political correctness. This is what you should rather do, in my opinion, as a filmmaker. And I think that with this is what most of the of these filmmak filmmakers in this Romanian new wave managed to do for a long while. Then, um, you know, now this uh, wave, if you want, is um, less impressive in a way because we got to be older. We are 20 years older and the challenge is not... The challenge is way more complicated for an older filmmaker because all of a sudden you are going to be compared with all the things that you did before, with all the things that all the others created in the same way. So it's a bit more complicated. A style which was very fresh, uh, very bold at the beginning, uh, started to be a kind of a routine and it's, it's, an, it's a manner of doing film, so you have to reinvent yourself. And as it's called a wave, it's just normal that it comes and goes and now there's another wave and things are changing. So now we are rather having, you know, out of these waves, a few directors with a very strong personal voice that continue working. 
And it's very good that after the first generation of, of, of younger filmmakers who are trying to continue, if you want, the trends of this wave, now there's an even younger generation who try to distance themselves from this and to do something completely different, because this is the only way of making your own voice present. It's a bit more complicated than this. I mean, um, it's not about um, US against Europe. And because uh, there are a lot of American independent small films which are not popular, even if they are shot there. So it's not about this. It's about how you quantify the success of a film. And from this perspective, we have to acknowledge that since their films are produced by private money, success is quantified by how much money you get back from that film. And it's not fair to judge that system compared to our system in which we use s public funding to make films. And the problem with using public money is that you don't have any kind of real feedback from the audience. Everything is state supported. So you cannot say that one of these systems is in itself fully better than the other. Um, they, and we need to say this, that the mainstream cinema is very effective in what it does. Its purpose is to sell some products which are appreciated by the audience, and they know to do this, we have to say, way better than we can. And the alternative was a way of selling more, if you want, personal and honest products for the audience, uh, which would be, you know, uh, more personal and nicer, but the purpose is still to sell them to the audience. If you create a very personal film in Europe with a lot to loads of funding and support, but nobody's interested in that film, you're not superior in any way. The audience is still somehow the final judge of what you do, and you cannot create films outside this feedback. And it's very difficult for you to get the real feedback if you, if you cannot, you know, produce films as they do. So I think that what matters, and I talked about this a little bit earlier, is to manage to preserve a sort of diversity. And never to forget that even if you want to work for a smaller niche, you need to be effective for that niche. Okay, you want to make films uh, for, the, for people appreciating very strong personal points of view of filmmakers who, I don't know, premiere their films in Cannes very well. But you need to be successful in that thing. But uh, uh, behind the one, two, three, three, five, ten, twenty people who are successful in that film, there are hundreds of people who are not successful. They are spending the resources in trying to be successful and they are not successful in neither of these models. They are not successful commercially and they are not successful enough in this kind of art house. They are producing a kind of cinema which doesn't really uh, find enough of an audience to justify its continuation of production. And this is why I think that, you know, um, a thing that we should do more is to invest way more into exposing young children to a different kind of cinema from a very early age. Because nowadays the taste for, uh, for films is, is shaped by social media and by their choices of what they watch since they are very, very small. And in this perspective, the Americans succeeded, you know, way better than us because they invested consistently for very many years after the Second World War and they have the star system. We have to acknowledge that there is no star system in, in Europe because the way Europe is composed. And it's not possible to have, you know, we have a lot of different languages. It's, it's a very different situation. So what you can do is to make sure that you invest more in education somehow because nowadays all the products especially coming from mainstream, mainstream, are being adapted to how young children react. And they react to this kind of visual stimuli in which something moves all the time, something changes all the time, everything is very, very fast, and 
you know, they are even having studies apparently about how often something needs to blink over there and everything goes very, very fast. And um, you expose them to this since age two or three and they watch Pixar and they watch this thing which are very nice and well done, but they watch YouTube and videos and it's impossible later on to get them back and expose them at the age of 10, 12, 13 to a different kind of rhythm. May it be the rhythm of the films done until the 80s or the rhythm of some European or Asian films which are done today as an alternative to mainstream cinema. And this is why um, um, there's never going to be like, uh, I don't know, um, a reasonable kind of, of splitting this, this global uh, world of, of, of viewers. Most of the people nowadays, we have to acknowledge, they prefer and watch something which is perceived as entertainment and they perceive cinema uh, fully as entertainment. I am paying, I need to get out, I get my car, go to a shopping mall, it takes uh, one hour of my life, I'm paying uh, tickets of 20 euros and uh, nachos of 20 more euros and it's Friday evening and I'm there with my friends and the choice of picking up films is very different. When you were going to your neighborhood uh, cinema, there was just one film running from Monday to Sunday or whatever. Now, when you go to a shopping mall, there are 10 films and you go there to watch them with a group and you will go for the most entertaining one and eventually there is the same film playing at uh, five different time slots of a quarter of an hour so that you can catch it. So this is lost. This is completely lost as a, as a competition. What you can do is to use nowadays uh, the platforms for your benefit. Instead of complaining that the platforms are taking the audience from you, you need to understand that they are also coagulating small niches of people who might choose your own film on condition that you manage to invest still in the promotion of that film so that they are searching for your film on the platform. For example, I have all my films on Netflix Romania, but they never show up if you listen, uh, if you search. Unless you know that they are there and you are looking for them, that algorithm will, will never going to bring them forward. So you need to, to look for them. So that is maybe a solution, but at the same time, keeping in mind that as a European filmmaker, you have to I don't know, to teach yourself to do an alternative kind of film which is entertaining in a different way, but still entertaining, you know, even intellectually entertaining. But there's no point in making, uh, you know, very personal films if they are boring and nobody wants to watch them, sorry. Yes, um, it's painful, <laughs> I have to say. And not, not that much the screenwriting, but um, deciding what to talk about, that's very difficult. And um, I think it's always connected with uh, a moment of my personal life. I was telling you about this first film, which was a comedy, but the theme of that film was connected with um, something that disappointed me a lot. I was decided to stay back home and try to change that country while most of the people of my generation decided very, very soon, and I was 21 in 1989, they decided that things are not going to change fast enough and if you want to have a, a good life, you need to leave. So they left and I was very disappointed because a lot of my personal effort and sacrifice, I felt that it was for nothing. We needed to succeed as a generation. And uh, okay, so I stayed and I wanted to make a film about this. And I made a film about migration, if you want, from the perspective of somebody staying back home and feeling left behind. And then for my second film, I was, um, I had become a father. I was the father of a young boy and I remember my period in which I was working for the radio as I was telling you and I realized that I grew older because my opinions about motherhood, fatherhood, parenthood changed and I realized that it's a bit more complicated and I was wondering what kind of film I want to make and I did something 
speaking about the process of writing, I kind of wrote uh, a portrait, a virtual portrait of the film I want to make before I knew the story. And I said, okay, what do I want to do now? I want to do something simple, something that is happening in a very short period of time, a uh, month, uh, a week, or ideally 24 hours. And then I want to do something from a subjective point of view. I will follow the main character in all the shots, and I will follow each other hour of this film. I wanted to have tension in the film. I wanted to speak about something personal and something relevant for the people of my generation. And once I pretty much knew what I was looking for, at some day, I, uh, this story that I knew from when I was very young came again and I recognized it as a story having the ingredients that I wanted for my film. And that's something that I try to do all the time, to understand, first of all, what kind of film I want to make, because if the story that you pick up doesn't have the ingredients from the beginning, the film won't turn as you want it to be. And that film was successful, I think, not um, because it was speaking, as people believe, uh, about abortion. It's not about abortion for me at all. It's about the relationship between freedom and responsibility. <laughs> you have to understand that freedom is a wonderful thing, but it comes with the res responsibility of your choice. That's all. And then you are free to use it. And from that film onwards, I learned that in my cinema, I don't want to push my own opinion about the topics that I'm bringing forward to the audience but I am trying to understand what are the different perspectives that people might have. And I allow people to have their own point of view, and this is why that film and a lot of films that I did later on were perceived as being a propaganda either for or against the choice, or then I made a film about religion, which was first of all perceived as a, a I don't know, a huge manifesto against uh, religion, but then the Orthodox Church decided to show it in monasteries, thinking <laughs> that it might be more Christian than you imagine at the beginning. And then, you know, I made that film, which was again, I was trying to speak about, in Beyond the Hills, about um, how relative good and evil can be today, and how difficult it is to distinguish one from the other. But the way I work, for example, I try to find the meaning of what I want to say after I find some story. So that story was uh, in all the press. I needed a few years before I learned what that story could be speaking about and that it spoke about love, finally, and about good and evil and about how wrong you can be in the name of doing good. And it has nothing to do with your intention of you know, doing things for good everybody was kind of wrong in a certain way and it was difficult to say uh, you know what's to be preferred people caring and doing wrong but by caring or people who uh, do not make any mistake but because they don't care and they don't act and that was also and then I made the graduation when my children were a bit older and it's a film again about about parenthood and for me it's a film about not about corruption but about compromise because you know there's a big difference between corruption and compromise compromise means that you know that you are doing wrong and you still do this you know it's you do it because you think that there is no other way of reaching a purpose while corruption is something that you never associate with yourself corruption is something always exterior everybody else is corrupt but not me we n none of us speak about corruption including ourselves in the, this idea and you know uh, that film is also based on certain things that I read in the press, certain things that happened while I was trying to raise my children. And, you know, I made that film when I realized that I'm puzzled about something, which I continued in element somehow, about what is the message to pass for your children given on what kind of world they are going to live in. Because you might continue, um, I don't know, uh, delivering a very romantic education to them, hoping that they will change the world for the better, uh, but at the same time, this might turn them to be into complete losers because the world is not changing to, to that, that direction and you are not teaching them to be survivors at all. 
and I noticed this very well by staying, you know, back home in Romania. I had to answer to this question every day. I'm driving to school, and the traffic in Bucharest is awful. Um, so while I'm driving the children to school at 8 o'clock in the morning, so you need to be on time, there's a crossroad. And at that crossroad, if I stop where I should stop before the light, all the other cars, all the other cars will stop in front of me and block the intersection. So I cannot pass. So there are two ways. Either you block them or they block you. And there's no way out of this. Uh, but uh, by this simple example, uh, this is more important for the child than a million generous things that you tell him. Because he sees that it's, it's a fight. It's either you or the others. There's no other way. And you know, this brings a lot of things about education and about for what kind of world you prepare him. While, you know, in this, this latest film that I did last year, I started thinking about, you know, uh, why do people react the way they react in, um, in this kind of uh, extreme situations? You know, we had that um, uh, fire in Bucharest a few years ago. Uh, it was, uh, I don't know, a disco place and somebody, you know, it got on fire and it was an awful accident and people, um, I don't know, um, very many people died trying to survive and I was wondering who survived, why and how they behaved. And of course, the ones who survived were not the ones who were nice. They were the ones who were stepping on everybody else's bodies to get outside. Sorry, but this is the way it goes. And you ask yourself, uh, if you, how are you prepared to react to a difficult situation and why is that uh, very instinctual side of yours always popping up? Eventually, when I was writing the screenplay, the war in Ukraine started and, you know, from today until tomorrow, like in every war, people who speak the same language, have the same history and the same religion, they knew each other and they were capable of murdering, raping and torturing somebody else with no problem whatsoever. And this is who we are. It's not nice, but this is who we are as humans. And then I started thinking about, you know, I'm always actually making the same film about human nature, trying to understand why and how do you behave like this in the circumstances. And even if my films seem to be social, about the social context, they are more, I don't know, hopefully anthropological, about the causes. Why do you behave like this? I try to, I don't know, understand or to at least reflect about this and to... Um, but you know, this is, uh, this is a discourse that I can have about what I did in my films after I did. But before I do, it's way more complicated. Because you don't have any clue, as you know, I don't know. And I ran across a lot of stories and nowadays it's very difficult for me to decide uh, because, you know, there's a pollution of audiovisual content. I would, you know, there are hundreds of films all the time on all the platforms. Everybody is making a film. There are 2,000 films made in Europe and uh, tons of American films. Everybody is producing a film. How can you, I don't know, uh, decide to make one other film that would be a little bit relevant in this world? Because I'm not that kind of a filmmaker that uh, takes this as his job. Ah, I'll just make another film and get some money. It's not, I take it very personally and I try to, I don't know, um, I try to, to lie to myself that at some point cinema can still be relevant and I will find a story that would be more relevant and more important than others. I'm not sure it's like this, but you need to convince yourself in order to move on. And it's difficult for me because the film needs to have a, a lot of, you know, to tick a lot of boxes. I cannot, I lose this, I don't know if I ever had it, you know, the, the easiness and the freshness of doing whatever, improvising, and I will see what gets out of it. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot work like this because, um, I don't know, uh, I have the pressure of expectations. And this is the problem whenever you manage to do something that created expectations, to start with. And I'm... I, I don't know my, my, my spectators by the name, but there's a profile of my spectators and I have a feeling that they exist in this world and they are waiting for my next film, having some expectations. So I feel that I have a responsibility. And this is why I work so much into finding something relevant and trying to have a film which is, I don't know, good enough for the audience so they can follow it, but it speaks about something and it's honest enough and not too controlled and it's a bit ambiguous and a lot of things so not easy for me
all starts from me knowing how I'm going to shoot. So when I write, I know that I'm going to use just master shots. So I knew writing that scene that that needs to be long. All the arguments that I found pro or against, I don't know, all the topics in the film needed to be there. The scene is very, very layered. The scene before is very layered. The scene has a lot of purposes. Um, you know, the film speaks in that period about this transformation that happens next to us when people lose individuality and their own personal points of view and they become a little sheep in a flock of sheep following and conforming to the general opinion because it's easier for you to hide, to hide bef be be behind I others. So I knew that it's going to be long. I knew that it needs to be natural. I There was for once um, a kind of a guide for me for that scene because that the film is based on a real incident and the scandal started from somebody shooting that um, reunion and placing it on the internet. It's in Hungarian, I had somebody translated it. So I knew more or less what the atmosphere was, but I couldn't use the arguments and the words because they were not coherent. So I knew while writing that it's going to be long and difficult to do. And in the screenplay, I think it had 26 or 27 pages. And uh, in the film, it has just 17 minutes. And this is because I realized that you know, while writing, the biggest difference between writing a scene like this and directing it is that in writing, because this is how writing is, you write line after line. This is what the program Final Draft permits you to do. But when people talk, they, they don't do like this. They speak at the same time. So on the set, when I started to rehearse this, I noticed, of course, immediately that I needed to improvise what other people were doing while these people were talking. And then I did something. I decided that I'm going to take the first eight pages of the screenplay and merge them with the next eight pages. So I started training people to mind what they had to say, but to speak at the same time. That's very, very difficult for actors. And I didn't have much time for any rehearsal. I had one day to block it prior to the shooting when I brought the actors just um, you know, in a set which was not ready, just for them to understand something very difficult for an actor that at the beginning we're going to be here with you and you talk in front of the audience and then I will follow a character going over there and I'm going to sit here and have the conversation. And actors learned through this very simple blocking that some of them are going to be 17 minutes behind the camera. And that's very difficult for an actor, way more difficult than being in front of the camera. So I needed to do something and I created on um, the wall facing the camera a wall full of mirrors. It's not that you see a lot in, in those mirrors, but psychologically for the actors speaking there, they were seeing themselves. And they had the feeling that the camera sees themselves and they are in the shot. And then I created the second camera from the situation. There was a camera pointed to them. Uh, we had like a reporter in the film. And I was shooting with that camera as well. And I was clapping for that camera as well. I believe that they suspected that I'm never going to use that material and I never used it, but it helped them concentrate at the same time. And then when the shooting came, I had two days of shooting that scene, which is very, very little. So first of all, I was looking as of a way, which you don't know in the screenplay, of placing all the speaking people in front of the camera so that you will see everybody, and this is very difficult. And the other, you know, the most difficult thing was that I still wanted, even if this is a collective scene, that is seen through the perspective of the main characters. So I knew what the movement is, I set the camera, I placed the two main characters in front of it, I knew what their actions needed to be so that you follow them most of the time, and then I started placing the others. I was alone in this room. It was, it was a huge room in which they were having, uh, I don't know, heating by uh, the logs, small logs of wood. So I got these logs as being my stand-ins. And I was placing, uh, you know, 17 logs to have them on 235. And then I wrote the names of the actors and I was trying to place them so that people talking to one another and commenting one another could see the others. 
And then I brought in the actors and I placed the actors on their places and we started rehearsing a little bit so that we get the right rhythm and so everybody knows what to say in connection to these people talking on top of them from this other side of the, of the room. And then, you know, chaos started when we started bringing the extras and we brought the first 100 extras and then 100 more extras so everything was crowded and then we started, we tried to have it, put it together. Nothing worked, it was a full mess, I have to say, because it was too complex. And um, even if I was improving things from one um, take to another, I had to improve a lot of things. And this was based, you know, it's, it's the natural time that such a scene takes before it's set right. And I was talking every other time to everybody, telling this, okay, we drop this, now you enter here and you say this. And as soon as he finishes saying this, you already comment and you continue. And little by little, I was trying to talk to them and to act for them and to give them indications about the rhythm. But in the first day, we couldn't get it right because it was complex and the actors never trust you that they need to know everything precisely. They know in general, at least the many actors I worked with. So they knew what they needed to say, but not precisely. And so I was very pissed off by the end of the day. I said, look, that's the most difficult scene that I've I shot and it's going to be the most difficult scene that you are ever going to shoot in your career. So just, I don't know what you do, but by tomorrow morning you need to know the text. If you know what you have to say, I will handle. If not, it's ruined. And, you know, I don't know what they did, but uh, somehow, you know, because I don't do this. And I wrote an email at 11 o'clock. I didn't speak to anybody by the end of the day, which is not common for me. I was kind of, you know, it's, it's, it was difficult and the pressure was very big. Uh, so the next morning they were a bit better. They knew a little bit the text. We started having them a little bit better, but still there were a lot of flaws because people were forgetting or whatever. And then, you know, we started having the right energy, the moment when, you know, I challenged another decision that you normally make as a filmmaker. You know, you will tell the extras, shut up. The actors are focusing, shut up, pretend that you're reacting. And at some point I said, you know what, uh, don't pretend, just react. React, you know, with as much energy as you want, for because for once you're not actors, you're not extras, you're actors. This is the Greek choir, you know, and you represent the fool. It's once in my lifetime when I really can work with the people, so react. And it was, you know, a huge mess, we couldn't listen to the actors, so for a couple of takes I, we couldn't do anything. And then I did something, I took an apple box and I started directing the extras as a conductor, if you want, but only for the moments of the reaction and the intensity of the reaction. That was not simple because as I was telling you, I placed that wall of mirrors over there, so all the time the camera guy was telling me, I see your hand in the mirror. But you know, it was a way of trying to match uh, the strength of the reactions and it helped the actors a lot because all of a sudden, nobody was polite with them any longer. They needed to fight to deliver their lines in the right moment and to listen to the others because it was a kind of a chaos which was somehow directed but still chaotic from time to time. And this is how, you know, little by little with all these improvements we managed to get in the second day to some shots with ha which had, let's say, the right rhythm. None of them was perfect, I knew from the beginning but I knew that I could pick one up and change something on the sound. And this is what I do always, uh, on condition that people uh, say the same lines every time, I can edit a little bit the sound and create a better take um, on condition that the rhythm is right. Of course, as it happens with the sound, I pick up, I picked up the best take was the take where the personal microphone of the guy talking the most in the scene at the end collapsed. So I didn't have that guy, but that was the best scene for me. So I recreated that guy from the microphones of everybody around him, just pushing the sound a little bit. And it was very complicated to do. But at the same time, you know, what, what matters is that mm, when I finished the film, after we got back from Cannes, I organized a screening precisely in the village where uh, the situation happened and precisely in that uh, town hall where the, the original reunion happened. So I was having, it was like an experiment, like an installation. The same people who were in the original situation were now watching the fictionalized situation. And it was a very special screening. The press was coming from Bucharest. Everybody expected the fight. 
But of course, it's, it doesn't work like this because cinema has this capacity of fictionalizing things and making you, it gives you the distance. And all of a sudden, they were watching a film 15 minutes later and they were laughing and it was somehow easier for them to pass over this idea that they, they were considered to be the most xenophobic people in Europe while, you know, they were just more honest than others. What they believe and express there is something that very many people express anonymously on the internet. It's just that they were living in such a tiny community that they didn't, rea didn't realize that once you speak in public, you speak in front of the world. So that was on the internet and it was easier for them to overpass the moment and I was there to tell them that it's not about them. That's cinema, it's fiction, it can be inspired by reality but it's not about them. And nobody is judging them. It, you can judge yourself for what happened and you can change your opinion or not. I'm just bringing this situation to light for everybody else to judge. And, you know, I, I like that, that the way that ended as an experience. Amazing. Thank you. Um, any, any, I have to say anything else. Uh, no, no more questions. Time to wrap up. You think it's, it's time. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Like uh, Welling says, like for an amazing uh, masterclass, uh, for being so generous to share, to share with your knowledge, with the audience. We are looking forward for your next movie to yeah, be I'm in Cannes, to be in Cannes one, yeah. or any other, any other festival. And please, a big grand hand of applause for Christian Mundur. Thank you. Thank you.